are between 28 to 32 weeks. Between 32 to 37 weeks, babies are called moderate to late preterm. So preterm birth rates, rates range from 5 to 18% across the world, with 11 countries with preterm birth rates of over 15% by rank, including Pakistan with preterm birth rate of 15.8. About 15 million preterm births occur every year, and this number is rising. 1.1 million babies die from preterm birth complication. More than 80% of preterm births occur between 32 to 37 weeks of gestation. As you can see here, this light blue colors between 32 to 37 weeks, more than 80% of preterm births occur in this range. And it occurs in developed as well as in developing countries. And most importantly, most of these babies can be survived with simple essential newborn care, including nutrition of preterm uh, babies. And more than 75% of death of preterm births can be prevented without doing intensive care. I stuck here. Sikandar, go back, uh, exit from the slideshow and again start. Can you see my slides? Yeah, it's visible now and it's moving. So, okay. These preterm births during their early lives have to face many health challenges like respiratory distress syndrome, intracranial hemorrhage, necrotizing enterocolitis, retinopathy of uh, prematurity, infections. And along with preterm birth, these health problems have impact on their later life and their impact is on the neurological and neurodevelopmental uh, impact. They have problems with cardiometabolic problems and mental health. As you can see here, the study have shown that, the meta-analysis have shown that the extremely or very preterm children born in antenatal corticosteroid and surfactant era show large deficit in intelligence. Similarly, this study has shown that the preterm births, especially the early preterm and late preterm birth, have problems more prevalence of hypertension, obesity, and metabolic syndrome as compared to their term counter counterparts. So what is the answer? Answer is the optimum nutritional management. And early aggressive nutritional support is associated with lower rates of death, short-term morbidities, improved growth, and neurodevelopmental outcomes. And the aim of nutritional management of preterm infant is to support a growth trajectory which mimics the fetal growth during the third trimester of gestation. And what happens in third trimester of gestation, the growth rate is the highest during that period, which is the weight gain of 15 to 20 grams per kg per day. There is increase in body weight of about sixfold body length of about 20 centimeter and about fourfold increase in brain growth between 24 to 40, 40 weeks of gestation. 
So what is the importance of postnatal growth? As shown in this systemic review, there is consistent positive associations between postnatal weight or head growth and their neurocognitive outcomes. As you can see, the influence of weight gain on later cognition, there are multiple studies with red bars which showing the positive outcome. Similarly, here in the influence of head circumference, these red bars shows positive outcome, outcome on later cognition. Serial growth monitoring allows early identification of growth faltering. And babies should be monitored daily for weight, weekly for head circumference, and length. Now, how sh we should monitor the growth of our preterm? We can monitor our preterm with growth velocity and preterm growth charts. The weight growth velocity, velocity can be measured with grams per kg per day, grams per day, or by a z-score, while head circumference and length can be measured through centimeters per week and change in z-score. Dennis Fenton, in a recent systemic review, have shown that for weight gain, grams per kg per day is most commonly used. While for head circumference and length, centimeters per, uh, per week is the most commonly used parameter. Similarly, our preterms should be monitored in preterm growth charts. They include the UK WHO growth charts. Fenton growth charts and inter recently introduced intergrowth 21st growth standards. The UK, UK WHO growth charts and Fenton growth charts basically targets the intrauterine growth and the weight at birth, while intergrowth 21st growth charts focuses the preterm growth, growth after postnatal period. This physiological adjustment to postnatal growth trajectory in healthy preterm infants. And this, uh, the study have shown that, if you can see here, this dotted line shows the intrauterine growth trajectory at 10th centile and at 50th centile. If the, pre if the birth occurs preterm, you can see there is diversion from this trajectory. And this is due to early contra this is uh, contraction of extracellular water. And after that period, this growth trajectory parallels the intrauterine growth trajectory. And you can see here at term, they meet uh, at 42 weeks of gestation. Our goals for growth velocity are weight gain at 15 to 20 grams per kg per day, Increase in length of about 0.7 to 1 centimeters per week and head circumference 0.7 to 1 centimeters per week. Dennis Fenton has shown in recent study the goals for growth monitoring of preterm infants that are support preterm infants to grow at rates and accrete nutrients similar to the fetus. Measure preterm infants for weight, head circumference, and length growth patterns and aim for growth that is approximately parallel to growth chart curves. Increasing weight out of proportion to length does not confer any developmental benefits. And if an infant's growth pattern deviates importantly from the expected growth patterns, ensure nutrition is optimized and assessed for possible contributing factors. Printer infants should grow at required growth velocity with the recommended nutri nutrient requirements.
And what are the nutrient, requ uh, nutrient requirements for preterm infants? These are based on Espegan recommendation for preterm nutrient requirements. Nutritional needs are defined as the amount and chemical form of a nutrient needed to support normal health, growth, and development without disturbing the metabolism of other nutrients. Meeting the nutritional needs of preterm infants represents a continuing challenging challenge for neonatologists and uh, the other related health professionals. To achieve optimal growth, adequate nutrition should be provided. I stuck every time. So energy requirement, the recommended energy intake should be between 110 to 135 kilocalories per kg per day. The energy requirement for preterm infants correspond to the sum of total energy expenditure and the energy stored in new tissue. The energy cost of growth includes the energy stored in new tissues and the cost of tissue synthesis. High energy intake during the first two weeks of life improve the brain growth and white metal maturation in preterm infants. Preterm infants require 135 mils per kg per day as the minimum fluid volume and 200 mils per kg per day as a reasonable upper limit. For routine feeding, rates of 150 to 180 mils per kg per day, nutrient intake, volume intake, when standard formula or fortified breast milk is used are likely to achieve the requirements. The recommended protein intake is three to four grams per kg per day for 1,000 to 1,800 grams and four to 4.5 grams per kg per day for the less than 1,000 grams baby. Approximately 10% of total caloric intake comes from the protein and provision of adequate protein intake is necessary, essential for somatic growth. The recommended fat intake is 4.8 to 6.6 .6 grams per kg per day and dietary lipids provide the preterm infant with much of energy needs, essential polyunsaturated fatty acids and lipid soluble vitamins. Lipids should constitute about 25 to 30% of total caloric intake, and MCT should constitute 40% of the total fatty in, uh, fat intake. Amount and composition of dietary lipids affect both growth patterns and body composition. Long chain polyunsaturated fatty acid deficiency interferes with the vision and neurodevelopment. Recommended carbohydrate intake is 10.5 grams per 100 kilocalories to 12 grams per 100 kilocalories. And it's a major source of energy and approximately 65% of total, total caloric intake comes from carbohydrates. And glucose is a principal circulating carbohydrates and the primary source for energy of the brain. Recommended calcium intake is 120 to 140 milligrams per kg per day. Adequate calcium retention ranges, uh, ranging decreases the risk of fractures, diminishes the clinical symptoms of osteopenia, and ensures appropriate mineralization in very low birth weight infants. Recommended phosphorus intake is 65 to 90 milligrams per kg per day, and phosphorus absorption is efficient in infants fed human milk or formula milk with a calcium to phosphorus ratio of 1.5 to 2. The vitamin D recommended intake is 800 to 1000 international units. Vitamin D supports large number of physiological processes such as immunity, bone mineralization, and neuromuscular function. And it should be started from two to three weeks of life. The recommended vitamin A intake is 400 to 1,000 micrograms per kg per day. If we talk about iron, it should be in a range of 2 to 3 milligrams per kg per day. 
as iron is essential for brain development and prevention of iron deficiency anemia. Evidence has shown an association between iron deficiency anemia and poor neurodevelopmental outcome in infants. Excessive iron supplementation of infants may lead to increased risk of infection, poor growth, and retinopathy of prematurity. And first, one must prevent not only the iron deficiency, but also the iron overload. If you talk about probiotics, scientific data have shown benefit for the use of probiotics. Double strain, lactobacillus and bifidobacterium has shown superiority against single strain probiotics. And it is associated with decreased mortality, incidence of NEC and sepsis. As in, uh, shown in this uh, study, uh, a systemic review of randomized control trial done in low income and medium income countries, which have shown that the effect of probiotics on necrotizing enterocolitis and on time to full enteral feed that favors probiotic use against the favors no probiotic use. These are the detailed macro and micronutrient recommended intakes. I can share the PDF of this format. I have no time uh, to describe uh, these all details in this uh, session. Now, from where we can get these nu nutrient and these nutrient requirements can be met by following types of nutrition. That is the parenteral nutrition and the enteral nutrition. And enteral nutrition can be achieved by human milk, fortified human milk, preterm formula, and post-discharge formula. If we talk about TPN, TPN should be started early, especially within the 48 hours. An early start of TPN shows improved growth velocity and late neurodevelopmental outcomes. And it should bridge the period until full enteral feeding is established. Here you can see start glucose in Fian at birth at four milligrams per kg per minute and increase rate daily or more frequently. Similarly at birth, start amino acid and start lipid atrophian on day one. Increase within two to four days, increase uh, protein or amino acid to 3.5 grams per kg per day. And our target caloric intake is 90 to 120 kilocalories per kg per day for optimal growth while patient is on TPN. Prolonged parenteral nutrition is associated with health risks like cholestasis, thrombosis, metabolic, and infections. Meeting the nutritional needs through full enteral nutrition is a general goal. Early start of enteral feeding after birth is safe with daily increments of 30 ml per kg per day. As shown in this systemic review, where there is no difference between early or late start. You can see here, there is uh, in, on a forest plot, there is no difference between early starts and the late start of enteral feeding. While early start of enteral feeding have shown growth benefits. If we talk about enteral nutrition, undoubtedly mother's own milk is the preferred source of nutrition for preterm infants because of its numerous short and long-term health benefits. Early oral administration of clostrum provides immunological components, probably stimulating the immune system and protecting from inadequate bacterial clonization by lactoferrin, secreti IgA, and other compounds. And to meet the growth rate of very preterm infants, increased supply of macro and micronutrient is necessary, which are principally present in human milk fortified. If required, fortification should be started when infants are tolerating 100 to 120 milliliters per kg per day. Preterm formula, which are specifically designed for preterm infants, 
is energy and raised to 80 kilocalories per 100 ml with protein content between 2 to 2.4 grams per deciliter. And it should only be used if human milk is not available. Post discharge formula is specifically designed for preterm infants post discharge nutrition. They have energy level between 72 to 74 kilocalories per 100 ml and protein content between 1.8 to 1.9 grams per deciliter. And it can be continued up to three to six months of life. These are the comparison of different types of enteral nutrition. If you, if you look about the preterm human milk, it, is, it has more protein, protein as compared to term human milk. But if we add human milk fortifier, it, the protein content can be increased up to three grams per 100 ml. Similarly, if you can see about the energy content, it is increased in preterm human milk, while with human milk, along with fortifiers, it is 85, which is increased uh, from the, even from the preterm formula. So what are the practical nutritional suggestions? If we divide, divide into three groups from less than 32 weeks until 32 to 34 weeks of age of gestation, start initial parental nutrition with protein intake from 1.5 grams per kg per day during the first 24 hours and uh, to 3.5 to 4 grams per kg per day thereafter. And with advancement of enteral nutrition, our first choice should be the human milk with fortification, while the second best alternative, if human milk is not available, is preterm formula. Total enteral and parenteral intake should aim at energy intake of 110 to 135 kilocalories per kg per day, while protein intake of 4 to 4.5 grams per kg per day with birth weight below 1,000 gram, while 3.5 to 4 grams per kg per day for babies of less than uh, for babies between 1,000 to 800 grams. From second group, which starts from 32 to 34 weeks age to term age, nutritional decision making is guided by the infant's growth pattern. Energy intake may be lowered from 135 to around 115 kilocalories per kg per day, provided that growth velocity is 10 to 15 grams per kg per day. Beyond 32 to 34 weeks, a high caloric diet may lead to excessive fat mass gain and switch to mainly protein enriched diet might be necessary to ensure optimal lean mass relative to fat mass accretion. And high protein supplies, supplies resulting in a higher protein to energy ratio must be maintained to meet the requirements for linear growth and brain development. From term age to six months of age, maintain energy and protein intake at around 110 kilocalories per kg per day and three grams, around three grams per kg per day respectively. Preterm infants who are completely human milk fed and feeding on direct mothers, fortification is practically impossible. Closely monitor the infant's growth pattern during this period. And in preterm infants who are formula fed, the recommended protein and energy intakes are, can be covered by nutrition, uh, nutrient and rich post discharge formulas. And similarly, if we can see these guidelines on the graph, you can see that from the early start, you can start with parenteral nutrition where and early start of enteral nutrition and focusing the total protein requirements of up to 4.5 grams 
per deciliter, which gradually increases by the time 36 weeks. And at term age, you can maintain between two to three grams per kg per day. If we look at the energy intake, you can start with parenteral nutrition and then early start of enteral nutrition and both the combined from enteral and parenteral nutrition, the energy intake should be between 110 to 135 kilocalories per kg per day. At around 32 to 34 weeks, you can lower it down to 110 kilocalories per kg per day. And at term age, you can maintain around 110 uh, kilocalories per kg per day. If we talk about the type of nutrition, you can start with parenteral nutrition, an early start of human milk. And then at, level, uh, at this level, you can introduce fortification and you can continue fortification until the growth velocity requirements are needed. And here again, you can see, you can taper off if the enteral feeding is achieved, you can taper off the parenteral nutrition. If human milk is not available, you can start the preterm formula here and you can switch here to the protein and rich formula, which is a post discharge formula, which can be continued if available up to three to six months of age. And if it is not available, you can switch to term formula from term, uh, term, uh, term age. So if we talk about the take home or take to work message, preterm provide preterm infants with recommended nutrient intakes should be the unit priority. Mother's own milk is the preferred source of nutrition for preterm infants. And fortification of human milk helps to meet nutritional and growth gaps of preterm infants. Accurate assessment and careful monitoring of the postnatal growth of preterm infant is needed to achieve the optimal long-term outcomes. To date, the intrauterine growth reference is the most accepted one the photo for the fetal growth. Maintain weight, head circumference, and the length growth patterns. And increasing weight out of proportion to length does not confirm confer any health benefits. Growth potential of preterm infants on appropriate nutrient intakes may vary. An infant needs to find their individual genetic potential that may be different from the size determined in utero. When infant's growth patterns deviate from the expected growth pattern, ensure that nutrition is optimized and examine for any possible contributing factors. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Thank you very much. If there are any questions from participants, you can raise your hands. We have Professor Sajid Makbul. Uh, sir, can you add or comment on the preterm growth and nutrition kindly, please? Sure, sir. Sure. If the panelists have any comments, please, uh, it will be a great honor. Um, I, I'm hoping to get the question first, but in any case, uh, first of all, uh, I think this is uh, the last one and one, they've been both extremely useful. The thing here is fact that uh, nutrition um, has now gained its rightful place as one of the most important factors uh, for uh, these um, preterm babies. And uh, initially, when started with this, you know, we uh, weren't sure uh, whether um, nutrition was as important and that, of course, was many years ago. And uh, it has its own um, benefits, not only 
for the uh, body uh, physical growth but also for um, mental growth and intellectual growth uh, in the coming years uh, so um, uh, the tendency now is to not only feed them but to try and feed them um, through the normal way that is the gastrointestinal uh, uh, feeding uh, enteral feeding rather than parental of course we have to resort to parental feeding when uh, we have a situation where medical conditions and or surgical conditions of the baby uh, prevent us from doing so. But there are many uh, who will continue to uh, feed by mouth, even with, for example, uh, PDA or um, those who are you know, catheterized and whatnot. So it depends on your comfort level. So um, trophic feedings, um, of course, serve a useful purpose. And we, I think, discussed last time also that um, uh, feeding uh, either through the nasogastric tube or um, enteral feeding as such has a number of advantages. It not only primes the gastrointestinal tract, but also helps in developing uh, a number of um, hormones and enzymes that are present in the intestines and uh, increases, um, for example, lactase activity, which is a big problem in our countries. And there are other hormones in there also. And I think that there is evidence that this might even decrease um, uh, the um, incidence of sepsis in, um, in, uh, in preterm babies. Now, uh, my uh, thing is that, um, my suggestion is that each unit uh, uh, where uh, prematures are handled, uh, form a plan of their own. And um, uh, guidelines are now available. Um, uh, growth monitoring charts are available. And, uh, you know, nutritional guidelines, you know, you can talk about how much protein, how much carbohydrates. And this has been covered very well by Dr. Sikandar. Um, how much fat, um, uh, those are the macronutrients and then the micronutrients uh, they have been elaborated very well. So um, each unit that handles this um, uh, either already has it or the ones who don't have it should have like a, a uniform plan of action. And uh, not only we have most units have it for um, prematures who get sick and how to handle it, but um, so many of them don't have uh, um, a... Uh, formal plan of nutrition of how to handle these babies. And uh, perhaps uh, in this day and age, it would be um, very sad if we ignored the importance of nutrition in this very, very important group. So I think with those, um, I, would, um, I would, these are just comments that I would add to the excellent presentation of Dr. Sikandar. And I'm then sure that there will be some questions in response to it uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Irfan and Junaid will have um, uh, uh, points to discuss and have their input uh, too. So I will give a general comments and um, I'll continue to be part of the discussion. Yeah, uh, Sikandar, it's a very nice uh, talk. Uh, and of course, uh, an excellent uh, wrap up by Dr. Sajid Makdul. Uh, I, I have a comment. Uh, the probiotics, yes, the, this uh, study was you showed that it helped, but it still is not the recommended, uh, especially in a baby's less than 1,000 grams. So we have to be very careful when we show these studies because people are. Uh, doing without the correct amount of the, uh, the dose and the correct strains, because not all the strains, there are about 200 probiotics uh, in the body. So we have to be very careful. Instead of uh, doing artificially, we should recommend breastfeeding, the breastfeeding and the breastfeeding. So we will uh, overcome on that. Uh, the other thing is uh, about what is your, uh, as Dr. Sajid Mahbul said, the next line of action, let's say the baby born premature, 30 weeker, 31 weeker, 
you increase the feeds uh, on breast milk, uh, you put on the fortifiers, but the baby is not growing. What is your plan of action for that uh, in your unit, Sikandar? So thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, the comment regarding uh, probiotic, you are very rightly said uh, that uh, the, for, uh, for, to use probiotic in very preterm infants uh, should be individualized and be cautious about using the probiotics, although the benefit have shown uh, in certain studies. Uh, but uh, still controversies and recommendations are still lacking regarding the dose, strain, and uh, type of my, uh, the probiotics. Uh, for the, your question regarding uh, our unit policy regarding uh, if the baby is not is if the baby is growth faltering, uh, again we have uh, started uh, uh, the use of uh, human milk fortifier in our unit, uh, especially uh, for babies who are not uh, gaining their weight uh, and uh, other um, uh, growth parameters. Uh, similarly, we have focused. Uh, for uh, uh, on the kangaroo mother care, we have started in our NICU, the kangaroo mother care, and we have recently published our uh, our study, uh, RCT, uh, again, uh, for the use of uh, kangaroo mother care in our preterm infant, and that, and that has shown uh, significant results uh, because if we introduce kangaroo mother care in our unit, especially in our setup, uh, that has increased the compliance of human milk, and then we have uh, made a plan of first we have made a plan to increase the volume of uh, uh, human milk up to 200 ml per kg per day to meet the uh, growth requirements of the baby i hope uh, professor irfan can add in it irfan are you there I think that also that um, when you have kangaroo care, it gives you an opportunity to, in our setups, especially in Pakistan, uh, gives us an opportunity to interact with the mother and thereby um, indoctrinate her in general um, terms on good nutrition and also to improve her nutrition and hydration, which is another benefit that, um, you know, that kangaroo care provides not only to the preterm infant. I think it also serves as and as a um, as a stimulus, uh, as uh, uh, as a confidence building measure, as uh, increasing the knowledge of the mother about the importance of nutrition, not only for the preterm baby but also for the mother herself. A lot of the mothers who uh, look after these babies are not very well nourished themselves and suffering from uh, repeated uh, pregnancies and uh, not getting adequate nutrition. Uh, and, and some, of course, themselves um, nutritionally deprived and have uh, multiple nutritional deficiencies. So that's another benefit that you can get from this. And that is spending more time with the mothers and uh, influencing them not only for this but for future uh, pregnancies or uh, and also this helps um, propagating uh, the message in the community because these mothers are very effective communicators as you know um, uh, women in general mothers in particular communicate um, the uh, the message is much better in their uh, families and in their communities Uh, can I ask, uh, hello? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a very nice discussion. So just to uh, continue as a discussion that, uh, what about, uh, the reflux precautions in the premature? I know is although the one talking, but what is uh, Sikandar, what you are doing if if the baby, if the overnight doctor stop the feed just because some regurgitation or, or some so-called or the nurses are worried about, what you are doing on that? So again, uh, if you talk about gastric residuals and uh, the reflux of the milk, uh, we have made a plan uh, to uh, 
to increase the threshold of stopping the uh, the enteral feeding, especially if uh, it remains below 30 mils per kg per day or, or the 30 percent of the total volume. So uh, we have made uh, like certain studies have shown that if there still there are uh, uh, gastric residuals, but you should not stop until it is significant because if the bile even is a green color, uh, if the green color uh, aspirate is coming out and this is a little amount that is a not significant and that the bile is necessary for the normal digestion and absorption of the uh, nutrients coming from the human milk. So we, are, uh, we have a policy to, uh, for, to increase the threshold where we have to stop uh, the enteral feeding or not. And uh, as Professor Sajid Madhbul sir have mentioned about the early start of uh, the minimum trophic feeding, uh, which uh, really helps to tolerate the further enteral nutrition progression. Oh, my question is uh, regarding the use of anti-reflex medication. How often you are using that? So, uh, uh, at uh, the current scenario. We have very uh, reduced, uh, especially we, we have reduced the uh, use of uh, meprazole. We have reduced the uh, use of uh, even uh, promotilytic dr uh, drugs because, as you uh, you have seen in the literature, that the use of uh, like meprazole or other drugs uh, to reduce the uh, gastric um, reflux, they have uh, confer the risk for infection in preterm babies. So we have yeah, made the so policy to reduce the risk, uh, the, to reduce the use of these uh, like anti-reflux medicines like H2 receptor blockers and and uh, proton pump in inhibitors. Yeah, so that's why I'm I, I'm asking this because uh, it's still uh, I notice in uh, Pakistan uh, the dome peridone is still uh, they are using a lot motilium what they said, so we should. Uh, discourage uh, the practice of using these type of medicines as a routine unless and until you have the, done the fluoroscopy and you find it out that there's a significant reflex then only uh, we can uh, use it i think talal has some questions uh, go ahead talal ji thank you very much uh, wonderful sir. wonderful talks sekandar i think so nicely illustrated and everything uh, two two things which i would rather echo what professor sajid bakul has already pointed out that uh, nutrition remains very very important and unfortunately we in pakistan now are entering an era where we are saving lots of pennies no doubt but unfortunately, we are still hooked on and uh, concentrating more on the respiratory care. In fact, I listened to one of the, uh, probably it was Mick Milton the other day in England, who was saying that I wish we can design some sort of monitors, like we have a respiratory monitor where it, it starts beeping every now and then with low sets and we run up and we rack up the oxygen. I wish world can design a monitor where it's always beeping that the baby is underfed, underfed and he's not getting a lot of nutrition, nutritional support as such. So no doubt it remains very important and extremely, that was a comment. One thing which I would like to point out, uh, the residuals that uh, Sikandar was mentioning, uh, if you listen to Joseph New, who's one of the gurus of nutrition, and they, they, they've stopped even doing the routine aspirations on babies, and they do no more aspirate babies. They say every time you aspirate, you get some sort of residue, and you in fact damage the mucosa of gut and the stomach mucosa, then you do the suction and you pull it up. So residues and aspirations are now probably out. And I think Sikandar is very rightly said that they and their unit are also now discouraging it. Another important point, which probably is a matter of a lot of debate and may become a bit controversial at times because we need to involve the ulamas into is, is use of donor human milk. Um, I don't know, but in our... Uh, setups at times parents are very willing that they want their khala or any family member who's already mother is not in a position to feed at this point in time and is not getting enough milk so we can get hold of some donor milk and use it i know it's got uh, religious implications there might be some because we are not into donor banks as yet there might be some cmb transfers and things like that 
but on the whole because we don't have ppn in our setup and with so much of high rate of sepsis i don't think so we at this point in time are in a stage where we can introduce tpn yes tpn is used in good setups no doubt where there's the amount of sepsis is less but uh, i don't know but i'm just putting in a point across the board that uh, professor sajid can bear me out or we can have more discussion on it that we should probably get into using donor milk maybe maybe not with some implications of it thank you I think the last time uh, Dr. Junaid had mentioned the acceptability of this uh, in the Middle East, um, it's not really forbidden from our religious point of view. It has medical implications uh, and uh, you know social uh, taboos and uh, restrictions. Uh, otherwise, I don't think there is. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there is a religious. Uh, bar on uh, you know having uh, a wet nurse or somebody from the family. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it is uh, you know we have the the example of our own prophet who uh, was fed sallallahu alaihi wasallam fed uh, yeah. by. by absolutely, sir. Absolutely right. It's 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 in oh. our religion. So yeah. why can't we do it in our part of the world? So, I, I think uh, we, Dalal, it is high time that we must embark. Or at times we, uh, we in our unit, we are fairly liberal, but we tell the parents, ke, okay, it's between you and the family that is giving, and uh, you can sort it out amongst themselves as long as they know, okay, it's, this this baby has had milk from this wet nurse. Uh, it's in our religion. It is a thing to be practiced. It is a thing to be introduced in the Islamic world, sir. Uh, the, the, Talal, one thing I have to be mentioned: the word of caution. Uh, as Doctor uh, Sir Sajid Mahbub said about that, uh, we get the fatwa, and what you are doing is the right thing. That the, if the consent, and it has to be the written consent. Later mm -hmm. on, there are legal implications that they said, no, nobody told us, and uh, we don't know this thing. This is the duty of the doctor. Bilkul. So, 100%. So we spot on. Uh, so, it has so to we, be with consent. No doubt yeah. about it. But and, uh, let's start yes. moving in that direction today. If we move 10 years down yes. the line, we so will we, have some sort of arrangement. Yeah. We, but it's the need written, of time. Yeah, yeah. If a written consent is there, that's fine. Then there is a new product, but this is a very, a very expensive. This is the human milk uh, reconstitute, uh, but it is very expensive. It's out of reach of uh, from our, our thing. So this is one of the uh, thing which uh, I had. I just have to mention that if the two parties consented in front of the doctor and it is documented, then it is, uh, uh, then it is uh, no problem. Okay. There is a question from Yasin Braham. Go ahead. Yes, salam, al salam alaikum. Uh, alaikum as -salam. Th thank you very much. I speak from Algeria. Uh, yeah. I have a question. When the pretend baby goes to home, uh, you you talk about uh, uh, a milk uh, protein enriched uh, uh, formula. Here in Algeria, there is no uh, such milk. Uh, do we uh, have have we to use a uh, uh, a preterm baby uh, formula for more long time, or how uh, or, or do do we uh, use a, a, a term formula then? That is my question, please. Sekander, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Yasin. Uh, Welcome, uh, Sam. A very uh, good question regarding the use of uh, post discharge uh, protein or nutrient enriched formula. Uh, recently, it has been introduced about a couple of uh, uh, years back in Pakistan, uh, but uh, obviously it is not available uh, all around. Uh, WHO, uh, WHO made uh, the recommendation if human milk is not present, you can, you can start with preterm formula, but preterm formula should be used as in-house formula. And uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the discharge onwards, you can uh, use uh, uh, you can use the term formula if the growth velocity and the growth parameters are uh, uh, meeting the requirements. 
Okay, maybe uh, Sikandar, I might just uh, add a little point, not about this, um, you know, um, also of um, other ways of fortifying formulas. Maybe you can send this uh, on the link. Uh, we've had this discussion before of when you don't have human milk fortifiers, how to increase the caloric strength of, uh, uh, of milk. Um, my uh, The practical point that I wanted to uh, sort of emphasize was uh, related to what has been raised as, um, you know, uh, reasons for not feeding a baby. And this uh, emanates mostly from the nurses or the junior officers, especially at night, you know, so a little bit of residual, as Dalale said, its residuals are not really uh, considered important anymore. We used to use 50% of the feed as cut off, but you know, these days uh, they're not considered very important. But at the same time, uh, the, 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 um, the nursery personnel should know that uh, the only reason to discontinue feeding or to withhold the feeding is actual vomiting, consistent vomiting, which is uh, something that um, you know, uh, needs to be monitored. Uh, um, presence of um, blood uh, or bile uh, and bile like you said just a tinge is not all, you know not anything to worry about and uh, if there are any changes in the blood in the stool for example blood in the stool then you may want to consider discontinuation temporarily or uh, you have you know distension or uh, changes or tenderness in the abdomen or changes in the bowel sounds, or there are other medical conditions. For example, if you have um, a baby who starts to get apnea, bradycardia, or um, decreased saturation or becomes lethargic, which may mean that he uh, has uh, maybe some, some impending uh, uh, sepsis or other conditions. So as a guideline, as a guideline, I think, Sikandar, it may serve us well to add to um, your presentation and say, uh, you should also be very particular about when not to uh, feed or hold feeding when, you know, when a senior yeah. person is around. I think that's also very important because I find that, you know, you go there after six hours or so in the nursery and some junior doctor or nurse has discontinued the feeding because there was a little spit up or because uh, there was a residual that uh, the, she checked. And uh, the next thing you know, you're six hours or eight hours behind. So, I mean, just as an addition, not to take anything away from uh, the excellent presentation that you've had, just to make things clearer. Thank you. So thank you very much and very rightly said, uh, uh, because it is a four module uh, uh, course. So, I have tried to not to uh, overlap the things because uh, previously we have discussed something uh, uh, about uh, these gastric residual. We have a lecture on NEC and the post-discharge problems. But uh, you have very rightly said as a whole, uh, I will add uh, these things in my uh, presentation, inshallah. Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, this is very much uh, very important. And uh, in the NEC lecture, uh, whoever giving, they should mention the myth and the controversies, myths and the realities of the feeding and not to feeding the babies, how fast you can go, how less you can go. So I think uh, whoever, I don't know who is giving that uh, talk in this module, uh, me and Dr. Sarazam Mahul uh, will be there, inshallah, inshallah. So we will talk at that time. Okay, if you allow me, I have to be at another meeting. So thank you very much. Uh, Inshallah, I'll be in the next one. Yes, sir. Thank you, so thank you sir. Almost two o'clock, I think. Uh, These are uh, time. Zoom meetings. So for us, and back. So, but thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you for the contribution, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Faraz, anything? Uh, I'll ask other participants if they have questions. We, we can wrap up. I guess there are yeah, no I questions. Think, yeah. There is one hand raised by Dr. Bashir. Dr. Bashir, please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Um, sir, my question is uh, uh, to Sikandar Sahib. Uh, sir, any commercially available T-PIN solution for preterms? Uh, 
Uh, the same we are using for the term infants or the, the period to gauge group. So actually, TPN are uh, actually uh, made available according to the certain like electrolytes, uh, blood sugars, uh, requirements of the baby. It is individualized. It is not available as such. It has to be made according to the needs of the baby, according to the condition of the baby. Mm. And uh, you have to uh, consult uh, the department, pharmacy department, who are actually actually uh, making these TPNs. Okay. Yeah. And so sec second, um, uh, can human milk fortifier uh, uh, can be mixed with the uh, uh, formula milk or not? When actually, no. human milk fortifier is for human milk. Okay. No, uh, Bashir, uh, tiger, uh, the human milk fortifier is only for the human milk because of the contents uh, of premature human milk is less than the requirement. So formula is already fortified. The premature term yeah. formula, the term formula is already fort fortified. So you don't have to add the uh, thing. Now the question what Yasin uh, asked in, from Algeria, that if they don't have the post discharge formula, then what they can do? There is two ways you can do, either to continue the breast milk and with the feeding of the preterm formula, okay, mm -hmm. uh, in between. So eight uh, uh, feeding in a day, let's say, so five feeding of the breast milk and three feeding of the normal formula. So that's, you can do it up to uh, six months of age when you introduce the other foods. Yes. Sorry, uh, my question uh, is that yeah. if human milk is available, mm. even then we have to go for that? Yes, this is the recommendation. See, the whole point is that, that you are fortifying uh, the breast milk up to 35 yeah. weeks, uh, you discharge the baby, uh, corrected age, am I right? Or 34 weeks, corrected age. So what happened after that? That's the, the, the amount of the, the micronutrients and the macronutrients and the, all those uh, things is required by the thing. So that's why the American Academy is conservative. It's say up to six months. But if you see the European consensus and SPEG and they say up to nine months, okay? So it is better to continue if the breast milk is available to continue with, so, in between uh, two or three formula feeding. And of course, you have to follow the baby, the growth, the other thing. This is not only the weight and the length. This is also the uh, involvement of the bone, the development of the bone, because osteopenia of the prematurity is very, very common in these babies. The calcium contents is very, very um, uh, iffy in different... Uh, uh, breast milk. So that's that's how it is, and uh, to it's recommended to continue with this uh, practice up to six months of age. Are there any other questions from participants? Okay. Uh, in the end, again, I would like to thank Speaker of Sikandar for such an excellent presentation. And I would also like to thank Dr. Professor Sajid Mukul for his contribution, Dr. Janaid, Dr. Talal, and all the participants who have contributed. Uh, thank you so much. And we'll meet again next uh, month, inshallah, on 20th for the third talk of this module. Uh, till then, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.